Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. 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 So we will go straight into the Word of God. Last Sunday I started a series called uh, Jesus Is. And Jesus is unique. We talked about uh, things that make Jesus different than anyone else and how Jesus is meant to be explained but also meant to be experienced. And today we will dive in a little bit further. A lot of people look for God and some people look for God I believe in four things and they are the wrong things uh, first one is they look for God in circumstances you know they want to see God through their circumstances the problem with circumstances is the fact that um, the problem with circumstances is the circumstances are not always the perfect predicament of who God is can somebody say amen sometimes the circumstances are good and we think God is good but sometimes circumstances are bad and God is still good some people look for God in tradition. The tradition typically paints God as an evil God. God out to get you. God out to punish you. And God is not always in the tradition. I respect tradition. I love tradition. But sometimes tradition, the Bible says, makes the word of God of no effect. And therefore we don't look for God. If you want to know who God is, you don't look at your circumstances. You don't look at tradition. And other people, it's, it's now more uh, popular now to look within to see who God is. To look within you to see who God is. The problem with looking within you, sometimes you can get lost looking within. The Bible says our heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart is supposed to be led by your spirit. Your heart is not supposed to be the leader of your spirit. The Bible says the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. They're not led by their heart. And I respect Oprah and stuff, so, but, but don't, don't follow your heart because it's like following a wheelbarrow. You're the one leading it. We follow the Lord. And therefore, that's who we find who God is, not in our heart. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you can look within and see some good stuff. And sometimes you can look within and it's like, OMG, Lord have mercy. That's not where you find who God is. Other people also, and this is the tree huggers more, you know, like people who just, uh, and that's good. That's also good. Nature is very good. Nature is beautiful. My wife here, she's a nature person and uh, you know, pets and animals, that's, that's all has its place. But you don't find God in nature. You find his attributes. You find little clues. But the nature of who God is, his goodness, his mercy, his heart is not found in nature. If you can, if you think you find definition of God in nature, you haven't been through a hurricane. Your house hasn't been flooded. You know, once the nature can be mean. Nature can be cold. And nature can be so hot like we see right now in California. Burns things, kills things. And so nature is not reflection of God. Your heart is not always reflection of God. Tradition is not reflection of God. Circumstances is not reflection of God. And who is? There's only one name. And his name is Jesus. Can somebody say amen? You want to know who God is? Look at Jesus. God spelled his name. For humanity in the person of Jesus that everybody can understand that everybody can know let's take a moment and read in the Word of God in Matthew chapter 19 verse 17 and it says the following it says this that and he said to him he speak, spoke to the rich rich young ruler he said why do you call me good because the young, young ruler came to Jesus and he says good teacher what should I do to obtain salvation? And Jesus replies back, he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Wow. It's kind of like people always say Jesus says some amazing things but that's sort of confusing. It's kind of like that verse where Jesus says, hate your father and your mother. But he said that. You're like, oh sorry, <laughs> skip that part. It probably has a deeper understanding. It's the same thing. Jesus says, no one is good. What does that mean? No one is good. I mean, we do good things, but I think God compares our goodness with His goodness. And He says, when you compare your goodness with my goodness, you know good. He says, as long as you compare your goodness with Hitler, yeah, of course you're good. And that's why God is saying same thing about hate your father and your mother. It doesn't mean hate your father and your mother. He says compare your love for me and your devotion to me and then compare your love toward your family. He says it actually almost looks like hate. 
It's not the hating he's focusing on. It's that it's the contrast in our devotion to him that he's focusing on. Are we are we on the same page? And so I want to just share with you a little bit about the divinity of Jesus, meaning that Jesus is God. The first thing, if you're taking notes, write this down, is Jesus is fully human. And what makes him fully human is we see this, is he was born. We see that he was growing. We see that Jesus was tired and thirsty. Jesus had human emotions. Jesus physically died and he also had a human body after his resurrection. And this is where the confusing part happens with a lot of young people because Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully human. He started his ministry being hungry yet he's the bread of life. He ended his ministry being thirsty yet he's the living water. He was tired and falling asleep yet he's at rest. Jesus wept yet he's the one that wipes her tears away. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver yet he is the one that redeems us and buys us to himself. Jesus died yet with his death defeated every power of death. See that is the divinity and the humanity. Jesus being fully God and Jesus being fully man. And you may say but Vlad I don't understand that and therefore I reject it. I still don't understand how a brown cow can eat green grass and produce white milk. But I drink milk. <laughs> Sometimes understanding can be put to the side. You know, just because you can't fit an ocean into a cup, it doesn't mean you shouldn't drink from the ocean. Sometimes we feel like if I can fit God into my mind, into my box that said I don't want to receive him. Actually, if you could explain God and fit him, he wouldn't be worthy of worship. I thank God that I can't fully comprehend everything. It makes him fascinating. It makes him intriguing. It makes him worthy of worship because I know he is bigger than this little peanut sized brain that I got in my head. That's why he's an amazing God. He's a great God and worthy to be praised. And so don't see the fact that sometimes certain things, for example, like Jesus being fully human and Jesus being fully God in one person. How could that? Don't see that as a stumbling block. See that as a cause to worship someone bigger than you. Someone that though you can't figure him out exactly 100%, but you can still worship and still receive from him all 100%. Somebody say hallelujah. And we see that in Jesus is Jesus being fully human. I heard the story of Diane Fossey and what uh, this lady she loved animals and she loved particularly gorillas and she studied a particular species of gorillas and she went to this place in Rwanda where these particular species of gorillas they were being extinguished they were actually dying out and the reason why they were dying out is because of poachers they would kill them and sell them and, and for very cheap and so she became so passionate for this that she actually moved to the place in Rwanda. She located herself there. She decided to live among the gorillas. She learned their language. She learned their behavior. She actually would beat herself in the chest. She would nurse their babies and she literally integrated herself in the life of these gorillas. She became also so protective for these gorillas that the stories go around that she would actually catch poachers and interrogate them. Sometimes kidnap their kids to, I mean she was, she was savage in a negative way. She was so passionate. And the breaking point happened when there's about 17 year old gorilla that she's seen from a baby from the infancy grow into this uh, this gorilla and this this particular gorilla was constantly isolated from 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 everyone else and she fell in love with this gorilla because she felt like she could relate to this gorilla she was always the outside of the society as well and this gorilla was always outside and when the poachers cut this gorilla and literally cut it into pieces and sold small pieces for 20 and 10 dollars on the black market and this is where she snapped and she went crazy. She went so radical crazy in protecting the gorillas that in 1985 December 26th she was gagged, destroyed by poachers with a machete. She gave her life for their good, lived among them and died protecting them. Now this is not a good example of Jesus 
because he didn't kidnap people and he didn't interrogate people but I want to just bring something from the earth to give you an example that Jesus didn't just come and lived as God he became the gorilla and not just to love on us and protect us but to fight the poachers of sin curse disease death and demons and all of those things and then he died protecting us giving us a way out Jesus was fully human what does that mean to us that Jesus was fully human it means one thing Jesus can relate I was meeting with a very wonderful person this week who was abused in childhood and when she started to share the story my heart just started to sink inside of me hurt inside of me and as I as I heard the story seeing how she overcoming that challenge but one thing that I could not do to this young lady is I couldn't relate because I wasn't abused and I told her, I said, there's somebody in our church who ministers to people like you and they, they can relate. I can give you the advice from the book. I can give you advice from the seminar, but I can't give you advice because I went through it. Jesus doesn't give you advice from the book. He gives you advice from experience. And the Bible says he was in always tempted like us except sin. It means Jesus went through exactly the same thing you went through. The only difference between Jesus, he actually didn't sin. So he did it the right way. Knowing that Jesus was fully human gives me a sense that when I come to God and I say, God, I'm discouraged. Jesus says, I know how you feel. When I come to God and say, God, I don't have a father. Jesus says, I know how you felt because history says that Jesus did not have a biological father. He died at the early age. When you come and say, I've been backstabbed by friends. Jesus says, I know how that feels. That hurts. When you come and say, Jesus, I am in physical pain. Jesus says, I know how that feels because 39 lashes hit my body. I know how it is to be in physical pain. If you're coming to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I am struggling financially. And Jesus will tell you, I know how that feels. I had to borrow a womb and borrow a tomb. I've been where you are. But what makes Jesus amazing is not just only he can relate to us, but he can actually do something about it. Because a lot of people can relate with you but a lot of those people the only thing they can do is pat you on the back and say I'm sorry but Jesus can weep at the tomb of Lazarus and after done relating he says let's remove the stone and raise the dead the humanity and the divinity of Jesus come on somebody number two Jesus is the second person of the Trinity so now we're talking a little bit more about Jesus God Jesus being divine Jesus is the second person of Trinity so not only Jesus being fully man and fully God if for many people this boggles their mind and a lot of religions they actually don't accept that fact and this is what str they struggle with Christianity for this reason especially people in, in Islam and people in other religions this is the part that's breaking for them that they have a hard time comprehending that and this makes it even more complicated the Trinity. The word Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible. It just simply, you know, what we, what we mean as Christians is that it's one God in three persons. And the Bible says the attributes we see of God's nature, we see little clues, as I said, in the nature. Though we don't see God's full character in the nature, because nature can be crazy, but we also can see certain things in the nature. And I want you to see in the nature how God left little clues there and there to tell us that He is a triune God. For example, time has present, past and future. Matter, it has solid, liquid and gas. Space has height, length and width. Light has source, illumination and energy. Water has, you know, H2O. Atoms, neutrons, protons, protons and electrons. Fire has fuel, oxygen and heat. I want you to see that things that God created on the earth, He already created them where it's one and three, one and three, one and three, one and three. Why did He do that? because that's the way he is and he left clues there so that so that even if you don't understand something there's so much evidence around you that you will say you know what I don't understand that but I know that about time I know that about matter space light water atoms and fire even you you know soul body and spirit but you're just one being and so God leaves those things all around we see for example Trinity in creation where God the Father he speaks and says let there be light and Jesus was the word and Jesus was that light but the spirit was hovering we see also Trinity in the Gospels where Jesus is coming down into water and the spirit is coming on him actually Jesus is coming out of the water spirit comes on him and we see the Father speaks we see a Trinity at work 
We see Jesus tells his disciples go and preach the gospel and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Now maybe you didn't realize but it doesn't say in the names of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. In the name. So that's, you may say well that's not proper English but it's proper theology. One God and three persons in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. We see Apostle Paul, he also says, he says, make sure that you guys, you know, strive to understand the grace of Jesus, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the Trinity all through the Bible and Jesus being a second person of the Trinity. Uh, you know, we actually uh, sell this. This is not the best example, but it helps the kids to understand, uh, you know, God the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. And uh, I heard a Catholic priest that used it and then the Catholic Church really got mad at him because it's not a best example. Let me say that again. This is not, there is really no best example and most accurate example to show the Trinity. But this one does good, plus it helps you to relax. <laughs> Amen. The one that, uh, that connected with me is the pretzel and so I actually got the pretzel. There's only one problem. It has two holes. This pretzel that we got today, <laughs> it has two holes so I'm not going to pull it out not to destroy the illustration and uh, but you can see this one. The first hole is not the second hole. The second hole is not the third hole but what binds them together is the dough. And so we see uh, Jesus, Jesus the Son is not Jesus, uh, God the Father and God the Father is not God the Holy Spirit but we know that they are one in essence but they are unique, distinct in persons. Now when I was preparing this message I asked myself this question, what does that mean to me? I mean awesome, God, one God in three persons, great. Don't understand it but super awesome. What does it mean to me? And I'm going to tell you what it means to you because I feel like the Holy Spirit kind of revealed that to me. The Trinity is an example of how atmosphere has to be built in our family. Because in every family there's a father, mother and a child. That's what three but one family. And Jesus used to disciples, he says, the way I am with my father, we are one. He says, I want you guys to be the same way amongst yourself. God left the Trinity as an example of how marriage relationships to be done. You don't see Jesus and the father fight against each other. You don't see the Holy Spirit and Jesus competing with each other. You don't see, you, you see complete unity and you see complete preference. Jesus comes on this earth, Father says, hey, this is my son. And Jesus says, hey, it's not about me, it's about the Father. Oh, and it's about the Spirit. The Spirit says, no, 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 it's not about me, it's about Jesus. It's like they're all competing on who's the first. And nobody can come up with, oh, who is the first? Now we know God the Father, the first face of the Trinity. We know God the Son and God the Spirit. But in reality, they're so united and they so love these persons, love each other. And they're one and they are an example to us of how a husband should treat his wife, how kids should treat their parents and how a family should treat the family. Your example of how the family life is supposed to be is not from your mom and your dad. Even if your mom and your dad had a great relationship, your example and your pattern is the Trinity. That's who you look to. That's why, you know, I know the tradition teaches, you know, a husband is the, is the head and the woman, you know, she's supposed to submit and it's true. But the Bible also says submit to one another. That means we are equal in the eyes of God and we live our life honoring each other. We live a life honoring parents, they honor their kids. The Bible says don't provoke your kids to anger. Meaning just because you pay the bills, you're not a monster. You're, you're, you're the mentor to their kids, not the tormentor to your kids. Because then if you torment them, they leave and they'll never talk to you. And you can blame it on them, on sin. But in reality, God created us to live in unity and God created us to live in love and respect toward each other. And that is how it works in Trinity and that's how it's supposed to work in our family. Hmm, not getting a lot of amens on this. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to live in unity. Amen. 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 Jesus said that he was God. So not only Jesus is the second person of Trinity and what we learn from Trinity is that how to relate to each other. What we learn from Jesus' humanity is how Jesus relates to us. But Jesus is the, Jesus said he was God. I have um, people that I came across with who are Muslim and, and a lot of times what Muslim people will say, and not just Muslim people will say, but a lot of actually people will say in the world that Christians 
decided and made Jesus God. Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never wanted to be God. He was just a normal good teacher and then after he died Christians decided to make him bigger than he was and they called him God. And so I just want to, if you ever come across that, you probably will if you interact with people from other faiths. I just want you to kind of present what the Bible actually says. Uh, first of all, it's important to know that actually no other religious has ever made claims to be God. Moses never claimed to be Jehovah. Buddha never claimed to be God. Muhammad, you know, about 500 years after Jesus' death, he never claimed to be Allah. Actually, Muhammad said, unless God doesn't throw a cloak of mercy over me, I am hopeless. Jesus says, unless you believe in me, you're hopeless different. Confucius, he says, I don't claim to be holy. And Jesus says, whoever can convince me of sin. Jesus was so holy that Pilate, who was, who was blessing the crucifixion, said, this is an innocent man. Judas, who was betraying him, said, I betrayed innocent blood. You know, Buddha said, I'm the teacher in search of truth. Muhammad said, I am the prophet of truth. Jesus came and says, I am the truth. That's a boss right there. And I'm not trying to belittle or, or, or belittle other faiths, but I just want to say that actually what the Bible says, what we believe Jesus says about himself. Jesus, it wasn't disciples of Jesus who made Jesus God. Jesus proclaimed and Jesus mentioned it. I want you to look at just a few scriptures. It says in John chapter 5 verse 18, now therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. And let me tell you why. Why the Jews were trying to kill him? Because he not only broke the Sabbath, they're, they were really committed to the Sabbath but also he said that God was his father making himself equal with God. So we're seeing that the Pharisees were furious about Jesus because he claimed that God was his father making himself equal with God. Actually the reason they crucified him wasn't because of his miracles, his deliverances and his charity work. It wasn't because of his sermons. It was because of blasphemy. Meaning he claimed to be God. Jesus could have easily during the trial say, hey guys you misunderstood me. I spoke in Greek, you speak Latin. I spoke in Hebrew, you didn't understand. I am not God. I'm just a servant. I'm just God's messenger. He would have never gotten crucified. Jesus claimed to be God and he died for it. Not only that but we also see in John 8 58 it says Jesus said to them most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was I am. Now some of you who might not read the Old Testament you might say well that sounds really awesome. What does that mean? It means very simple when Moses met God this was the secret code that Israel had with God. So that you don't get some kind of ghost speaking to you but you can kind of ask the question what is your name and that's what Moses asked God. He says what is your name and God says and Israel knew because the name of God was I am. Meaning I'm always present, I'm always alive, I'm eternal. And so when Moses asked God who are you speaking from the bush over there and God says I am. Oh you God. So Jesus comes to the Pharisees and surround them and he said before Abraham I am. He says, I am that I am. Not I was, not I'll be, I am. He's I am God. In John 10, 10, it says that John 10, 30, it says, I and the Father are one. Just based on these three scriptures, it's pretty obvious Jesus is God. He claims to be God. Two things Jesus did that God does. One is he forgave sin. It confused the people is it really people started to hate him for that when he forgave sins and he, he he looked at them he says why are you so worried he says what is it easier to say to rise up or to say that your sins are forgiven see you can say your sins are forgiven to anybody because there's really no way to check it and Jesus says I'm not throwing words on the wind because if I'll be throwing words on the wind whatever I'm about to say next wouldn't work and he says next rise up and walk the guy rises up and walks so he says Jesus said, I'm not throwing words on the wind when I forgave that man I actually clean his slate completely because I'll be paying for his sins in about three years from now. I am God. That's why I forgive sins. And not only Jesus forgave sins which revealed that he was God on this earth but there is another thing that Jesus did is he accepted worship. Let me surprise you. He actually accepted worship as an infant. He was a baby 
and the wise men worshipped him and Jesus didn't stop saying hey yo 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 I'm just a baby guys come on and drop the gifts hasta la vista baby but don't worship me Jesus accepted worship from the people who would get healed Jesus accepted worship from his disciples when he's he walked on water Jesus accepted worship from Thomas when he touched his side and he says my Lord my God and he worshipped him Jesus did never stop and say hey guys that's a blasphemy angels did that to Cornelius angels did it to the Apostle John when John was about to bow and just says whoa whoa, whoa you, you can't do that Jesus knew better the only God is worthy of worship and when people worshiped him he complimented them not corrected them which tells us he claimed to be God he lived as God because he was God are you with me and lastly Jesus is God and God is good the verse that we read today a young ruler comes to Jesus and says good teacher what should I do to obtain salvation and Jesus says why do you call me good is it because I'm God or is it because you're throwing words in the wind and confuse that man completely and he's like dude I don't know just just answer the question Jesus please and I pause on that verse because Jesus revealed something about God that God he could use any word angels worship and say holy holy he could have used the word holy to define the characteristic the heart of God but this word Jesus used to define God he said God no one is but God is good that means compared to all the goodness in this world let's say all the goodness in this room all the good things you've done all the people you've blessed all the people I gave cars to I gave money to all the people you have helped on the road all the times you've helped your child all the times you've helped your spouse all the times you forgave people put all of the goodness and there's a lot of goodness in this room guys pull of that on the scale put that on the scale and God says and you put me on the other side and your goodness becomes zero in comparison to how good I am Jesus is God and God is good what makes God good and not us is the fact that God is good consistently that's why we say God is good and we reply see this is what makes God different his goodness than ours our goodness is dependent on the mood you don't get your coffee no goodness if you're a woman and the monthly week came in, the hell week, no goodness. If you do something against me, no goodness. The video wasn't playing right today, no goodness. Some, somebody crosses your road, no goodness. And the, what difference about God is God says, my goodness is not dependent on the outside. My goodness is dependent on me. I am self-existent and I don't need nobody and no reason to be good. I am that I am. I am good. I am good. Hallelujah. You know, I studied this week a little bit about the life. Of Jesus and I saw that Jesus's goodness was practical not theoretical Jesus who was God could have come on this earth and literally messed us up with his knowledge about the universe he could have fried our brains about the invention of internet 2,000 years ago can you imagine Jesus knew about the iPhone that's gonna come out in 2006 Jesus knew about the Bluetooth that is going to be invented. Jesus knew about Snapchat. Jesus could have come on this earth and literally downloaded to his disciples say, hey guys, invent eBay, invent Amazon, invent, you know, PC, in, in, invent this. Jesus knew all of that and he chose not to share the secrets about universe because Jesus is not theoretical. Jesus is not just a theory. Jesus is practical in his goodness. He was so simple in his goodness. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he found money in the mouth of the fish to pay the taxes, he fed people with bread, he cleansed the lepers, he opened the eyes of the blind, he opened the ears of the deaf. This is God. God is practical. You're hurting in your marriage? God is bringing healing in your marriage. You're hurting in your body? God who knows the 
universe. God who commands angels and archangels. But he is concerned. His goodness is not reduced to a theory that's so confusing. The scientists might not understand. His goodness is reduced to a simple life. Where God's goodness is expressed in good in your life. Ah, God is so good. He knew they'll come up with the internet. He knew they'll come up with computers. They'll come up with cars. He knew. God knew. They'll come up with cars that will drive in the space. They'll come up with a ship that will take us to Mars. All of that. But what humanity needs is not just an invention. I place that in them. They'll discover that. What they need is the revelation that I as a God, I am good and I am practical. The first the first sin was the sin when when Satan came to Adam and he told Adam this God is withholding something good the forbidden tree holds secrets the forbidden tree holds some mystery God gave you everything but the best thing about God is still hidden from you listen Satan will lead us into sin by causing us to doubt God's goodness but my Bible makes me to understand that knowing God's goodness leads me into repentance See, when you know that God is holding something back, you will always, 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 always live in sin. Because you think it's in the bottle that you find joy. You think it's when sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend, this is where you find real excitement and you explore your sexuality. You think that if you do drugs, you do this and this and that, this is where your life is there. But listen, God withholds nothing good from those who fear Him. If you want to be on the bait of Satan, I'm going to tell you how it's going to happen. God is good and Satan will put a question mark there and say, not really. If he is good, why this happen? Why that happen? God is good? Not really. Not for you. He's not good. And Satan will take you by the bait. And if you want to overcome that, if you want to overcome sin, you have to overcome this lie that God holds nothing bad from me. The reason why I lived until 24 and I lost my virginity to my wife. Best decision of my life. Might cost me after this. I believed when God said in His Word to live holy, He wasn't trying to steal my fun. I was crazy enough to believe He actually wanted good for me I believed in that the reason why I don't steal is because I believe when God says don't steal he wants good for me the reason why I pay my tithes I come to church and I read his word I, I believe somewhere sometimes I take a risk because my feelings say but God might hold something back if you go to the way of Satan and sin you will really find the goodness but I took two risk and I'm 31 years of age and I can tell you one thing God has been good I have tasted and I have seen God's commandments aren't burdensome. His yoke is easy and His burden is light and whatever if He asks me to stay away from something it's probably a razor that's gonna cut my tongue and cause me to bleed to death. If God is withholding something it's usually something that is bad for me and I have chose to believe that God is good in my hard time and in my good time, in sickness or in health, in defeat or in victory, God is good and I hold on to that. The moment you believe God is good, you will actually live a life of repentance because you will know there is no need to run from Him. Satan will lie to you and say, God is withholding something good. And the moment you fall into sin, this is what Satan will say. Now, God will never forgive you. He's not that good to accept you back. You messed up too much, but Satan is a liar. God is not only good to keep me away from sin, God is good that even if I fall into sin to pick me out from that sin and knowing that He is good leads me into repentance out of my sin into His kingdom. Jesus is good. When an adulterous woman was brought to Muhammad, he asked to stone her for adultery. When an adulterous woman was brought to Jesus, he protected her from stoning because he was good. Muhammad commissioned and blessed a killing of a blind man. Jesus healed a blind man. He married 13 wives and kept sex slaves, slept with 19 year old girl. My Jesus, he showed goodness 
Heschel remained single. Muhammad murdered those who insulted him. Jesus was insulted and murdered by those who hated him. He allowed people to hurt him, to show that I am good, even when you're not. He ordered a slave to build a pulpit from which Muhammad would preach. Jesus removed his robe and washed the feet of his disciples. All the followers of Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, they said that he ordered people to give their life for him. All the people who follow Jesus said he gave his life for those that follow him. I want you to see the goodness of Jesus. In John there is seven I am's where he said I am the bread of life. Bread is good. Bread is practical. Then he says also that I am the light of the world. Light is good and light is practical. And then after that he says that I'm also the door to the green pastures. The door is practical and the door is good. Anytime you see the door you can see a new season, you can see a new place. And then he says I'm also a good shepherd. I'm not just any kind of shepherd. He says I'm good at what I do. I take care of the sheep. I take care of my people. And then Jesus says not only that, he says, I am resurrection and life. I am life and I am resurrection. This is not a theory. This is not one day. He raised people from the dead. And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And lastly, he said, I am the true vine. I want you to see this about Jesus. Jesus is good and he's practically good. And I'm not talking about in the book. I'm talking about in life when he was on this earth. He did good things to reveal to us he is good that's why I believe in healing that's why I believe God doesn't want us to live in poverty God doesn't want us to live in rejection God doesn't want us to live in abuse God doesn't want us to live even if you've been through divorce if you've been you've lost your virginity maybe you lived in sin maybe you're coming here today and you feel guilty for some things that you've done or maybe you've done drugs maybe you've sold drugs maybe you were abused or maybe you're the abuser and you're, you're ashamed of that. I want to tell you something. You're not coming to Moses who killed sinners. You're coming to Jesus who died for sinners. You are coming to someone who is good. And until you believe in that, your life will not change. We all know the story of Mishibosheth. I'm going to finish on this. is the, the tale of two sons. The first one was Mephibosheth to 2 Samuel chapter 9 where Mephibosheth was a son of Jonathan and Mephibosheth fell and both of his fell his nurse dropped him and because of that he became crippled and David sends to Mephibosheth a message he said listen I want to show you kindness come and Mephibosheth was scared because what if David is trying to kill me pretending to be good because see anytime you're in Lodabar, anytime you've been dropped by people, anytime you're living in a place of no pasture, you're always suspicious. It's too good to be true. You get married and you're waiting for your spouse to leave you. You get a good breakthrough and you're waiting for a breakdown. Why? Because your life has always been bad. And there God comes to Mephibosheth through David and he says, listen, I want to be good to you. And Mephibosheth is afraid because everybody dropped, dropped him. Everybody let him down and, and here is another opportunity. Somebody's going to lie to me. And Mephibosheth swallowed that fear and he says, you know what? I will take a risk and believe David doesn't have a secret agenda and he's not going to kill me. And he goes in and that goodness from David covered the problems of Mephibosheth and whatever it didn't cover it changed and Mephibosheth's life was changed. In next chapter Hanan was also a son whose father died and the Bible says David does exactly to Hanan what he did to Mephibosheth. He sends messenger and he says listen your dad passed away I'm so sorry I just, I'm here to comfort you probably he brought him gifts probably he brought him some contracts maybe some connections says listen I'm here to help you I'm here to build your kingdom unlike Mephibosheth Hanan was actually in the palace Mephibosheth was crippled in his body but Hanan was crippled in his mind because when he heard the news that David is trying to be good like many people he believed it was a lie and he says no David is trying to attack me he's looking for a weak spot and what he did, he took the messengers, he shaved them, he embarrassed them, he mocked them. And thus, instead of receiving the goodness, he started a war. And yes, he was defeated and yes, he lost. Who are you? Mephibosheth? 
maybe you have a crippled situation but there's something worse than having a crippled situation is to have a crippled mind thinking God is always out to get you punish you and God is good to everyone but you that is a crippled mind and that can destroy your life not your situation but that mindset or you're like Hannon who maybe maybe things in your life are somewhat good but you believe that no 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 God doesn't help people God only helps those who help themselves you need to if you want to make it you you make it you make it happen you don't need a savior because you are your own savior you God's goodness will have no place in your life I want you to humble yourself today and say Lord in spite of my situation in spite of my predicament I know that you are good and I believe in that amen God is good and all the time God is good and all the time I said God is good and all the time God is good and all the time if you believe in that stand to your feet say this with me God is good and all the time God is good and all the time look at your situation I want you to say that God is good and all the time look at your finances right now and just tell them that God is good all the time thank you for watching this content I hope this was a blessing to you if you're like me and you like to click on things click on this subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it and remember the best is yet to come.